tonight I've been assigned by Gabe to preach on the topic of family. So that's the topic that was given to me. Uh, and I know this is supposed to be a, a, a dating series. So I will focus on the worldview and values that you want to have in common with your future spouse. So if you're dating, these are conversations that you should be having. Uh, if you're courting, even, meaning if you're engaged, even more so. Uh, and uh, if you're looking for your spouse and if you're looking for someone and you're trying to cultivate friendship, you should be having conversations about uh, the, your worldview regarding family life. And that would contribute to being equally yoked. Uh, so being equally yoked is not just, uh, it is primarily first and foremost being believers, being fellow believers in Jesus Christ. But beyond that, there are also certain values that you uh, ought to share. I'll just give you a quick one really quickly. If you, uh, as a husband, uh, you know, really believe that uh, you need to have a super charismatic experience in order to feel like you're close with God. So you go to a church where, where, they're, doing, where they're doing healing every single week. Uh, but if the wife says, that's not the tradition I come from, and I don't really need that, even though both are, are Jesus-loving Christians, uh, that relationship uh, might not work, you know, because, uh, because you might fight over where to go to church. Uh, and one person might say, I'm not getting fed at this type of church. And another person might say, I'm not getting the emotional experience. We can talk at another time about what is the biblical position on spiritual gifts. But that is just an example. That's just an example of of being equally yoked is more than just being fellow believers in Christ, but it is uh, in many ways having a similar conviction, worldview, uh, and understanding and agreement on what it means to be a family and what it means to raise children uh, and how that goes. So I'm going to start, let me, let me hit this slide. So I'm going to start with a review of Gabe's main points that, that have a relation to family. Uh, I am uh, I'm grateful for Gabe. I listened to that sermon. This is a true story. And I slacked him this morning and told him too. I had a sermon dialed up uh, that I that I revamped. And um, bas basically, you know, I, I, I wrote it a long time ago, preached it. I revamped it for you guys. Then this morning, I, I put on my I put on my earbuds, listened to his sermon, which was really, really good. And I had to rewrite my entire sermon because he he covered so many points that I would have covered. And so that's just how excellent I think his first sermon was. I, I, I commend him for that. But let me give you a quick review. So true story that, that you know, Gabe did an excellent job. Last, last time, uh, Gabe explained that in Genesis 1, God created the human race in his own image, and he created us as male and female. And that's why in the title, I entitled it God's image, God's mission, family, God's image, mission, and family. And then God's ori original mission was to fill the earth with his glory through biological reproduction. So if you were if you were with IT last time, that's what Gabe talked about, that husband and wife are supposed to uh, be fruitful and multiply. And by multiplying image bearers of God, and this is this was supposed to be before the fall of man, you're you're reproducing people who are reflecting and projecting the glory of God across the face of this earth. And then in Genesis 2, so that's where the teaching went, is the biological reproduction was designed to happen through the exclusive sexual union of a heterosexual marriage. It was Adam and Eve, uh, not Adam and Steve. And so each sexual union entails loving one's uh, family and forming a new family unit. So it was very clear that when, when it says you you leave and cleave your family and you you know you leave your family then you cleave to your wife so each time a new family unit uh, starts and they reproduce uh, they reproduce image bearers that is basically the protection of marriage within uh, the marriage or, or with of sex that's that's where sexual uh, activity is supposed to happen within the covenant of marriage so it's very clear from genesis 1 into genesis 2 that you're talking about individual family units reproducing image bearers of god and that was the original mission and god's mission was to be carried out uh, through every individual family and the family then gabe said was designed to be the cultural building blocks of society and that is true and so God's design for marriage and family was not confined to just being a family for the sake of being a family. If you understand the biblical foundation and God's design for the family, it's that your family unit was designed to be a vehicle to advance God's mission. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight. Uh, the first point, and 
my my main points are are long tonight. Um, I can't always do this on the Sunday sermons, uh, but with this crowd, I feel like I can, and um, blame this on the pastors that I look up to. Uh, you know, and so so this is I in the in the first ten years of my ministry, all I listened to was John Piper. So. Uh, and MacArthur, so blame them. Uh, this is this is very uh, this is a very Piperian type of length of a point, but hopefully you can get it down. Is that the point number one is God's design for families to cultivate God-given skills and spiritual gifts for the glory of God and the common good. That is that is the first point. That is the purpose of family. Family, the family unit was God's original vehicle to advance His mission. So it totally makes sense. That if Satan is going to attack, he's going to try to divide the family. Okay, and, I, and so I want you to see that a little bit. But Adam's call from God before the fall of man was to cultivate. That's one of the first things that God tells, calls him to do. He says, you are responsible to cultivate the garden. Uh, and so you can take your Bibles and turn with me to Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 28. We're revisiting a passage that uh, Gabe took you to last time, but... Genesis 1, verse 28, and it says, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing uh, that moves on the earth. So last time it was explained that basically God told them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. You got that part. That's the mission. But then when you look at the second half of verse 28, it says subdue. What does that mean? To subdue means to put under. And so Adam's goal was to actually subdue. He was to rule in a certain way, not over other human beings, because once you have other image bearers, they're equal in terms, of, in terms of how God sees every human being. But then it says to have dominion. So you're supposed to reign. He's supposed to have a dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And this would include serpents. I always think that, think it's funny, um, you know, not that I, I think that I'm so much better than Adam. I, th I think all of us, we, we can look at Adam and just say, come on, bonehead. But I mean, if we were put in his shoes, we might stumble too. But, but I, I want to ask Adam, whoever told you the serpents could talk? You know, I mean, if, if a lizard came and talked to you, you probably wouldn't think that that's normal. If a serpent came around, if a snake came around and talked to you, uh, you would probably think it's weird. But his goal was to subdue. And, and so if, if, if you're Adam and you're supposed to exercise dominion over all of these animals and you have one animal that comes up to you and says, God is not real. Don't trust him. Don't listen to him. Uh, or actually, it's Eve. But Adam listened to Eve right? The serpent told me this. Uh, if you're Eve, why would you listen? But it was Adam's job, not Eve's job. It was Adam's job to be the original person who should have crushed the head of the serpent. That's his job, to be fruitful, multiply, but to exercise dominion over the animals, to subdue anything that would challenge God's reign and rule. Uh, and one of my questions leading back to the mission then is that are we saying that the human race was simply supposed to reproduce children. Is that it? Again, this is before the fall of man. So uh, obviously nowadays, God accomplishes his mission through, through uh, not just through families, but through many who are single. So if you're single, if you feel called to singleness, you know, God's mission applies to you very readily. Uh, but is that all we're supposed to do? I mean, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. Is, is that it? Uh, is that all there was to life? So basically, before the fall of man, if the fall never happened, that we're just supposed to just reproduce, that's it? Um, is this the cultural mandate or is this the Roman Catholic mandate? And I say that as a joke, not as an insult, because Roman Catholics traditionally don't uh, don't believe in any type of uh, contraception. So they encourage these really large families. So is that all we're supposed to do is just to have a bunch of kids uh, and, and fill the earth? And that's where you have to go a little deeper. And I want to take you to another familiar passage uh, that I, I believe Gabe referred to it too, as the Genesis 2.15. So just take your Bibles, turn one page or scroll down a little bit and uh, on your electronic device and you'll see Genesis 2.15. Uh, here's, here's Adam's job, right? Adam was a gardener. So God, it says God took Adam and put him in the Garden of Eden and God tells Adam to cultivate it and guard it. So if you understand what families are supposed to do, families are not just supposed to 
generate children. That's not all they're doing. And, and what do you do with these children? I mean, is that the goal then? So, so before the fall, you raise your kids and say, that's your goal to meet someone uh, and to have sexual relations and to generate more children and that's it and die. Or, or they were supposed to live forever, right? Uh, but it, it, is that all it is? Uh, and so God gives him specific instructions, which is cultivated and guarded two things. And that's where point number one is for God's design for families to, in quotes, cultivate God given skills and spiritual gifts for the glory of God and for the common good of man. This word in the Hebrew cultivate, it means to prepare. It means to develop. It means to rearrange. It means to improve. It means to grow the garden. Uh, to order the garden, to put the garden into order, uh, to kill pests, including uh, serpents that would come in and, and try to threaten God's reign and rule. Uh, and so you're supposed to do everything to glorify God. In other words, Adam's task was to work. He had a job, which was to rearrange the, the raw materials that God created to bring about food, crops, and plants. And so you can envision that the entire earth is a garden of Eden at this point. Because, because before sin, all the families are supposed to live in the Garden of Eden. And as they're cultivating what God has created, as they're cultivating, improving it, generating food, they're blessing and building society. They're blessing, the, they're, they're providing food and, and resources for the common good of man, right? And then the second thing is to guard it and guard men to Adam, to keep pure and undefiled. But, um, I want you to think of Adam as a gardener. And if you're an engineer or if you're in technology or you're in architecture or you're in music, you know, you're basically a gardener of steroids, right? This is gardening is prototypical work. And, and, and here's how you have to understand it is that, is that Adam is simply rearranging the raw materials created by God resulting in the product of food or crops. Uh, man did not create food uh, ex nihilo, meaning man simply reordered and rearranged what God created. And, and uh, if you're familiar with Tim Keller, he kind of explains this a little bit when he talks about the purpose of vocation. Like Adam didn't create the dirt. He couldn't. He didn't create, he didn't create water. Uh, he did not create the sunlight. All of those things are necessary to, uh, to cultivate a garden. He simply took what God created, these raw materials, and he developed them. Over the development of civilization, even after the fall of man, we call that technology. So if you're an engineer, for example, what are you doing, right? You're, you don't invent natural resources per se. I mean, you might develop them, um, but you're taking resources and, and your, your architecture, construction, technology, you're rearranging with knowledge and wisdom, you're made in the image of God to think, to create, uh, and and you're building then as an engineer, or you know, you're you're ensuring that structures are safe. You're building shelters for families, bridges for communities, uh, churches, making these bu bu buildings beautiful, safe, operational. Uh, this is all a gift of God. It's for the well-being of man. Music, like I mentioned, is uh, is taking the raw material of sound. I mean, you can't invent. A sound out of nothing, right? God gives us the raw material of sound. And what musicians do, they are like, made in the image of God, not God, but like God, where they're rearranging and reordering sound. And, and Matthew can tell you about this for our enjoyment. So it's for the good of man, but it's for the glory of God. So worship and theater, literature, writing, filmmaking, this is taking the raw material of human experience. Uh, the reason why novels and movies connect with your heart is because you can somewhat relate to it. Even if it's fantasy, it's something that you wish for and you long for. So when you consider that you actually have to have God give human beings life experience in order for stories to be written, still, you're taking the raw materials of human experience, shaping them into stories and narratives that make us in, to help us interpret life and help us make sense of life. And if you understand then what Gabe introduced last week, which is a cultural mandate, then you understand then the goal for parenting. So prior to the fall, they actually had a goal, is that God had given every single human being, that, that was his idea. I know that it didn't go too far, but, but if Adam and Eve hadn't sinned, I, I would believe that God would give every single human being God-given skills to continue to develop that garden and continue to advance society. But in a fallen world, in our a fallen world, we know 
that the first purpose, and, and so, so Gabe talked about marriage last week, so now I'm going to talk about marriage and then family, right? So if you're generating children, then you're talking about parenting. Uh, and this is essential because these are the conversations you ought to be having uh, prior to engagement, is in a fallen world, we all know that uh, as Christians, the first spiritual goal is to spur your children on toward the gospel. Very clear is that we can't convert our children. We can't do the work of the spirit to change their hearts. But we have to do everything that we can in our example, in our teaching, uh, in our confession of our mistakes and our sins, in our, our including them and bringing them into a covenant community, uh, the local church. And in everything that we do, we're supposed to spur and point our children towards uh, the saving work of Jesus Christ and towards the gospel so that they themselves would, be, would receive Christ. And we would pray that the spirit would do that work. That's given. So raising your family with, with biblical principles, with a Christ-centered worldview, that is all given. But beyond that, I think God has given every single child, he creates every single child with gifts and skills. And so, so this takes some experimentation. And so as parents, uh, one of the things that God calls you to do is to bring out that inner gardener in your child uh, and, and really to, to look at your children that God will give you one day or that may, maybe you have and to say, I need to help this child discover and develop their God-given skills. So whether you're Christian or not, right, whether they are, I mean, whether they are Christian or not at that point, whether they're saved or not, they still have skills. So you might have your kids experiment with music and learning piano or, or art, or, or you put them into, you know, sports, you put them into all these activities and, and their personalities start to come out and you're, then you're guiding them. And then if Jesus saves them, then the Holy Spirit gives them spiritual gifts. So when you combine God-given skills and spiritual gifts, that is part of what the vocation of a parent is. So it's not just reproduce children and fill the earth, right? It is very much to, yes, understand the family unit is, if God wills it uh, for people and he allows it, to reproduce image bearers of God to help each child discover their God-given skills, to develop those skills, and then on top of that, once they're saved, like I mentioned, to discover and develop their spiritual gifts in the local church. And together, when you take a Christian, now young woman or young, young man leaving their home and leaving and cleaving to their spouse, at that point, they should be developed independently to make an impact in the world for Jesus Christ. And so that is the expansion of God's kingdom. So we understand that there is a fall. There's a fall, right? Uh, and so, so as I mentioned, as I mentioned in point number one, uh, point point number one is that it's God's design uh, for for the family, for families to cultivate God-given skills and spiritual gifts for the glory of God and for the common good. So uh, there is a purpose, and how this ties back to dating once again is is that when you date someone, do they agree with you? Do they agree with you? Uh, so I I'm going to assume that with this group, it is given that, that you should date a fellow believer in Jesus Christ. They should be a mature believer. Uh, and uh, you should be talking through those things, right? Biblical worldview, Christian worldview, uh, theology, and sound doctrine. But beyond that, when you talk about parenting, do you agree that this is God's design for the family? And that this is what you're going to do with your children when you raise them? And so you need to have those conversations. And obviously, it's okay not to know. It's okay to have a conversation and to learn, to have a conversation and say, wow, I didn't know that. So what do you think about these teachings? What do you think about these truths? Let's read a book together. Let's develop this more. Let's think about it. Okay. Um, point number two, point number two is God's redemptive design for families to guard and I'm going to use the word preserve because now we're, we're post fall. So again, Adam was given these uh, commands and instructions, uh, and this was the design before the fall of man. Once sin entered, then what are you guarding, right? So basically for us, we're preserving his created order. So the created order is not destroyed. It's fallen. It's marred. Uh, so God's redemptive design for families is to guard, or I would say preserve his created order. Okay, so go back to Genesis 2.15 and the Hebrew word keep, to keep, it's a verb, to keep. To keep, you could translate that as to guard, to protect. And as I mentioned, Adam's original goal was to not blame his wife, 
but to protect his wife. Remember that God spoke directly to Adam. God didn't, and, and told Adam, you know, you can eat from all the trees of this garden, but you must not eat from the, from this, this, this tree, this particular tree of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so the serpent comes, tempts Eve, uh, and Eve says, wow, really? Okay, so Eve takes a bite. And I believe that if Adam actually lovingly, you know, corrected Eve and said, no, this is wrong. We don't do this. We obey God. Uh, then I, then, then there's a probably good chance the fall wouldn't have happened, but it's because Adam gave in. And that's why uh, Christ is the new Adam. That's why Romans talks about all sin entered through one man. It doesn't say it's Eve's fault, even though Eve was the first one to sin, uh, it was Adam's fault. And so Christ comes as the new Adam, but Adam's job was to guard his wife, was to guard the garden and to basically guard God's created order. And God's created order is very clear, right? That there's, that he creates male and female uh, and, uh, and, and they are complementary, And that, that's what Gabe talked about. Uh, and, uh, and he was supposed to guard the law of the Lord, at least at that point, I'm not talking about the Mosaic law, but God's, God's instructions to obey God, to trust God, all of this, Adam was supposed to guard the order, right? But go to Genesis 3.12, and I want you to see that Satan, when he wants to destroy God's order, when he wants to attack, he attacks the family. He, he doesn't start attacking trees, that would be pretty funny. He's like, oh, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start tearing down your work, Adam. Uh, all the stuff you've cultivated, uh, all the stuff you've built, your garden. I'm gonna trash your garden. He doesn't do that. Instead, he says, I'm gonna attack your relationship. I'm gonna attack your family. So in Genesis 3:12, Adam blames his wife. This is what Adam says. Adam says, the woman that you gave to be with me. So he kind of blames God a little bit. That's pretty bad. He says, the woman. So first, he blames the woman that you. God gave to me. She gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then in Genesis 3, 16, God reveals the consequences of sin. Not only will childbearing be painful and Gabe made this point already last time, but in Genesis 3, 16, it says your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. So now you're seeing the unhealthy relationships come forward where the male was supposed to protect. He was supposed to guard. He was supposed to lead. And because his wife isn't, isn't going to respect him as much, you know, he ha he's going to have to domineer, he's going to try to rule over and her desire is going to want to rule over him like, well, he should have led me better. And, and, and so you begin to see that if Satan wants to attack, he begins to attack the created order. And so in many ways, you see an anti missional pattern emerge here, basically hinder God's mission by attacking the vehicle of the mission, which was the family unit. Attack the family unit. That's the, that's the unit that's supposed to reproduce the image bearers and spread out uh, the glory of God across the face of the earth. If you attack the family, then you will, you will, you will succeed in, in hindering the mission. And so, so that's, that's what Satan wants to do. Uh, now what happens in Genesis four, again, uh, it's not just husband and wife, but now you got children now who are attacked and sin basically shows itself. So what happens in Genesis chapter four? I'm not gonna refer to any specific uh, verse, uh, but when you look at Genesis chapter four, Adam and Eve, they do what God originally told them to do, right? So they do, they are fruitful. They do multiply and they do generate children, Cain and Abel. Then in Genesis 4, 8, Cain kills his brother Abel out of anger and jealousy. Cain murders his brother. So the first effect of the fall was, was Adam blaming Eve. Okay, that's the first effect of the fall was a marital issue. And the second effect recorded in scripture is sibling relationships. It's, it's one brother murdering his, other, his, his, his sibling, his brother over jealousy. So you can see Satan wants to attack. He's going to attack the family. Those are the first two effects we see from the fall. And it wasn't just Adam's family that was impacted. Uh, as a result of sin, every family of the earth would be under the curse of sin. And by the time you get to Genesis chapter 6, I do want you to turn there. I want you to see this. Okay, Genesis chapter 6, I want you to look at verse 5. So this is, this is before God sends the flood during the time of Noah. 
So remember the original mandate. The original mandate was what? Be fruitful, reproduce, and reproduce them across the face of this earth. They obey the great, that commission, that cultural mandate in a fallen, imperfect way. And Genesis chapter six, verse five says, the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Then you skip down to verse 11, Genesis chapter six, verse 11. Now it says, uh, it says, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight. The earth was filled with violence. You just have to pause there. The earth was supposed to be filled with life. The earth was supposed to be filled with people imaging the glory of God. That was the original mission. But because of sin and because of the attack on God's order and God's design for the family, this is what has happened by the time you get to Genesis chapter 6, that God looks at the earth and he says it's corrupt. And he says it is filled with people. It's filled with people, but it's filled with violence. And I, and I won't get into the flood today, but, but uh, that was a one-time type of judgment that God had to. Uh, the, the, the earth was so evil that in order for the redemptive seed to continue, he preserved Noah and his family, but he had to just destroy um, humanity at that point, except for Noah's family, right? because it was that bad. So I can say, and I think it's safe for you to say, that any attack on marriage and family, even if the people don't know it, uh, is an attack not only on God's design for the family, but on God's original mission. And ultimately, it's a, it's a rebellion against God himself. And that continues today. And I'm not saying we should be upset and angry, uh, but I think we have to be mindful. Now, I can't see all of you um, in terms of your, your picture, but um, how many of you guys listen to Al Mohler? Just kind of raise your hand, you fellow uh, nerds. Okay, so Al Mohler, Albert Mohler, um, you can Google that. He's the president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, but he does a daily podcast, a daily kind of a, a, a radio show, um, and you can find that on his website. It's about 25 minutes every weekday for the most part, uh, and he gives commentary on current events uh, from a Christian worldview, and, and that's, that's part of his gift to the church. Uh, and so this morning, so this is this morning, like I said, Gabe, Gabe preached so well that it forced me to rewrite my sermon this afternoon, that this morning, Al Mohler, he talked about something happening in the European nation of Hungary uh, that made U.S. headlines. And I just want to take from the transcript a little bit. So, so I'm going to talk you through some of Mohler's uh, podcast this morning, but I will give my commentary on it, right? So uh, this is what, these are the words of Mohler. Uh, CNN offers the headline. Hungary passes anti-LGBTQ law effectively barring same-sex couples from adopting. So you talk about adoption. That's my commentary now. You talk about adoption. You're talking about that uh, adoption agencies are, are in Hungary. They want uh, there to be a mommy and a daddy. They want the mommy to be a, a female and the daddy to be a male. And that's God's order. That's how it's been for a millennia, right? So... Um, Mueller continues. So this is happening in Europe. And Mueller says the New York Times headline, Hungary further expands the executive power and curtails gay rights. So that's how um, our secular media is interpreting this. Now, all across the international media in Europe and in North America in particular, there, there are screaming headlines about the fact that Hungary has now turned back the modern age. Basically, what Mueller is saying is that the nation of Hungary is being treated as repressing human rights because they want to define parenthood and family the ways the way that families have been defined for most of human history. And Mueller notes that CNN's report starts this way: "Quote: Hungary's parliament is voted to has has voted to redefine the concept of a family in the in." in the country's constitutional family. Uh, and so interestingly is put in quotation marks. Yes, we're at the point now, Mueller says, where the use of the word family has to be put in quotation marks because when we think about family, you, they're saying that you can't just think about family as husband, wife, male, female, and children, right? Family can be redefined in so many different ways according to the uh, LGBTQ agenda. So that's where we're at. 
Moeller says, a move that will effectively bar same-sex couples from adopting children. So that's what they're doing in Hungary. The move has been met, CNN says, with outcry from human rights groups and LGBTQ advocates. The story goes on, the country's politicians approved the bill on Tuesday. The new law defines marriage as between a man and a woman and asserts that the foundation of the family is marriage and the parent-child relationship uh, the mother's a woman, the father's a man. And to that point, Moeller says, quote, how in the world could this be controversial, end quote. And so we're in a world now where it is very controversial for you to say that when I use the word father or dad, that I'm referring to a man. And when I use uh, the term mom or mother, that I'm referring to a woman or a female, adult. And when, I, and when I refer to children, I'm talking about either adopted or, or children who are generated. Even that type of language is going to be seen or it is seen as repressive, as anti-human rights. Uh, and so Moeller warns, quote, that this is where Christians have to understand that we are in, in the same outlaw position as the nation of Hungary. We have no choice but to define family, marriage for that matter, motherhood and fatherhood in biblical terms. But if Hungary is now an outlaw, then if you hold a biblical definition to a biblical definition of marriage, family and parenthood, mother, father, then you are an outlaw as well, end quote. Uh, so for that matter, I mean, just consider how much more of an outlaw we may be uh, because of the revolutionary direction uh, that we're now seeing in American culture. And so uh, we're gonna be outlaws. And so your family is gonna be an outlaw. So Mueller goes on to say, and, and I'm just, I'll conclude that section, is that we are looking at the subversion of the entire moral order. What's he talking about? Well, he's talking about Genesis. He's talking about this order that God designed uh, for families, right? Uh, and so, so he's saying that uh, we're looking at the subversion of the entire moral order, but the point here is that Hungary is pressing back. And so you have this secular nation pressing back. Hungary is saying, we are not going to abandon the entire order of creation. We're not going to pretend. We're not going to act as if we actually think that a mother can be anything more than a female or a father anything other than a male. And, and so I, I think this is really relevant for us, right? So in, in the first point tonight, uh, it, it, it was saying, it was focusing on cultivating that the responsibility of parenting, the responsibility of family, uh, it's to remember God's order, his design for families to cultivate God-given skills and spiritual gifts for the glory of God. And that's part of the advancement of, of you know, for the common good of man, but for the glory of God. But uh, here in point number two is to guard. God's redemptive design for families, traditional families, is to actually, nowadays, you don't even have to say anything. If you simply operate or believe in the traditional family, you are in many ways guarding, meaning you're preserving the created order because we live in a fallen world. So I'm not saying that we should, we should expect the movements of expressive individualism or transgenderism or identity and gender politics for that to go away. That's the world we live in. It's not just the United States. Look in Europe, all over the place, in Asia. What I am saying is we need to be ready. We need to be loving and sober. Uh, we Not being, again, combative, but to be able to say, this is where I stand. This is what I believe. And I no doubt believe that among Christians, even, this will impact who's willing to date you and who you're willing to date based on your understanding of the created order and God's design in contrast to what is popular in secular culture. And so God's redemptive design for families is to guard the created order. And that's simply by being uh, normal, I would say, or traditional or what it's always been. Uh, and so I, I believe that this is, this is very uh, relevant. And that exact, that is what Adam was supposed to do. He was supposed to defend the garden of Eden from the serpent. And this would include lies, right? S Satan was lying to Eve, and Adam's job was to tell his wife, she is lying. That is a false ideology. That is a false worldview. That is a lie that God is holding something back from you. And that if you eat that fruit, you're going to be like him. And, and he's holding that back from you, right? That is a lie. That is a, that, is a world, that is a false worldview. In the same way, Adam was supposed to defend the garden from these ideologies. And that's what we do now, though we're post-fall, so we do it through and in Christ. 
And so now for those of you who are single, and uh, some of you have the gift that Paul talks about, possibly that you might be single all your life. And if you desire to hold biblical convictions, even if you don't want uh, to cultivate a traditional family, uh, you can't be shocked it, that people criticize you based on your simple belief in the definition of a family or how you operate towards your family, right? You're meaning your parents and, and your, your siblings as they have families and, uh, and, and in church, you know, what, what's being taught in churches to children? How do they think about these things? And so uh, again, if the family was God's main vehicle for spreading his mission, then the attack uh, to dissemble, to reorder definitions, to redefine, uh, and to hinder God's order totally makes sense. And so we shouldn't be shocked. This is what Satan does. Uh, that leads to point number three. Point number three is Christ-centered family units experience redemption, comma, <laughs> preserve God's order, comma, and project the goodness of God's design. Okay, so what you have here is when we seek and when we try and when we struggle uh, to live out and to live out and practice uh, uh, what it means to be a Christ-centered family, every Christ-centered family unit experiences redemption. Redemption in the gospel. I'm going to show you that uh, in a moment. Uh, we experience redemption in terms of the marriage relationship, though it's a challenge. We preserve God's order because we're trying to just do what, what has been normal for the longest time. We preserve God's order. But the third one is the missional part is what does it mean to uh, reflect the image of God? So the word image, you know, in the Greek, it's icon. In, in, in the Hebrew, there's a word image, of, you know, it is to reflect. Uh, but I don't want you to think of the image as you look in a mirror and you see yourself. Uh, when, when I look in the mirror, I don't see God. <laughs> okay. And if you're looking in the mirror and if you see God, there's something wrong with you. Okay, so, uh, so I don't think that's what, what God was telling Adam, that Adam, go over to the pond, look into the pond, and when you see yourself, that's God. No, you know, God is God. He is spirit, uh, and, and he created the human race, right? We are the creatures. And so when you think of what God means by his image is that in your soul, in your being, that God created you in his likeness. There is a stamp of the creator in every human being uh, and the sin caused that image to fall. But I think more of uh, like when you're holding a mirror at an angle and when light hits that mirror and it reflects in a certain direction, think of that as, as imaging the glory of God. So, so as people look to you, uh, it is a reflection of God's character, not that they would see God himself, right? They would see a reflection and, and it can go out like light, right? Uh, and so in the same way, when, when we are struggling to raise our kids uh, and to raise our children, and, and so even if you're not married, you're, if you're helping out in church and discipling children and youth and, and collegians, you are guiding them to hopefully uh, use, discover, develop uh, their, their God-given skills, their spiritual gifts, uh, and in that way, you're projecting, reflecting, helping them reflect the goodness of God's design. Uh, but even as people look to you as a traditional family unit, they're seeing that created order. And, and by, by the mere fact that you operate as a husband and wife or wife and husband um, with children in a traditional setting, you're projecting the goodness of that good design. Uh, is that there are serious problems and consequences when you, when you, when you don't have... Um, when you don't have that traditional model, right? Uh, and so I do want you to look at Colossians chapter three. Um, my purpose is not to exposit the passage, but to simply highlight the direct uh, reversal of the curse of the fall. Um, and so tonight's sermon was very topical. Uh, so, so tonight in my dreams, I'm going to have John MacArthur rebuke me, uh, <laughs> one of my, one of my, uh, my heroes, <laughs> um, you know, growing up. <laughs> uh, uh, but this is very much topical, but uh, Colossians 3, verse 10, and as well, Colossians uh, 3, 18 and 21. And Colossians 3, 10, I actually have a slide for you, okay? And, and, and I want you to see this comparison. Um, just look at the comparison. In Genesis 3, 
right? This is, this is what happened as a result of sin entering, as a result of the fall. Uh, God said, your desire will be, Eve, for your husband. So to control or dominate your husband, he will rule over you. And then in Genesis 3, Adam blames his wife. He says, the woman that you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Now you look at Colossians 3. Rather than wanting to control your husband, Colossians 3.18, wives, submit to your husbands as fitting to the Lord. So you see this in Ephesians 5 as well, but, uh, but I chose Colossians. And then look at verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. So I chose this version rather than Ephesians. It says, love your wives. Don't blame them. Don't throw her under the bus. Do not be harsh with them. All right, this is this is a complete reversal. So what you see in God's design for marriage as Christians, marriage in Christ, is a reversal of the curse of the fall. Uh, obviously, in every marriage, there's going to be conflict. Or there's going to it's inevitable. So it is in the act of dying to ourselves. It is a painful process uh, where you learn to die to yourself. You argue. You reconcile in Christ. You forgive over and over again, and you start practicing God's created design and order. And then you go down in verses. Uh, nine uh verses uh 20 and 21 it says children obey your parents uh in everything for this pleases the lord uh and fathers do not provoke your children let they less lest they become discouraged so there again you see um you see what what's happening with uh with the the renewal of the created order now you go back up to uh, colossians 3 verse 10 and colossians 3 verse 10 it states that as believers, we are being renewed in knowledge after the image of our creator. Do you see that? That is, so, so you go back and this is an entire wrap now where uh, from the beginning, it, God says, Adam, I created Adam and Eve. You have been created male and female in the image of God. The fall of man causes the image of God to be marred, not destroyed, but, but completely distorted. And in and through the gospel of Jesus Christ, as believers, we're being renewed in knowledge. We're learning, uh, not just in the mind, but in our hearts. We're being renewed after that image. It's being renewed. And the result of that renewal is what you see here on this slide, right on, on the right side, where, where it talks about wives submit to your husbands as fitting to the Lord and husbands love your wives and do not be harsh with them and children obey your parents and everything for this pleases the Lord and fathers do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. That is because the image of God is being renewed. So when we attempt to live out the biblical worldview of, uh, of marriage and family, we're basically reflecting a renewed image of God towards the world. And this is what I mean by now we are re. Uh, we are experiencing redemption of that cultural mandate in, in a different sense. Uh, and so this is the relationship between family and missions. This is the relationship between God's image and missions uh, and the family unit being redeemed. So here's your big idea. The big idea uh, for, for tonight is God's image, mission, and family are cultivated, guarded, redeemed in Christ. God's image, mission, family are cultivated, guarded. So those are the two words used in uh, the cultural mandate uh, or in uh, Genesis chapter two, I, I should say, um, and then redeemed in Christ. So when it comes to dating, once again, uh, I know we're talking about family, not so much about you know dating principles or dating tips or, or, or dating wisdom, but it is critical that you discuss matters of your theological views on family, including God's design and purpose for families. And it, it may be difficult. And many times these conversations can, um, can, can be tense if, if you're talking to someone who is maybe not from the same church, maybe they haven't been taught or sat under the same things, but um, these are very important. Uh, and we need to help each other uh, to battle these worldly ideas so that we can do so uh, in, in a loving way. Uh, and so I'm not going to say more uh, about this right now. Um, I know that Gabe is going to do an, an excellent job just kind of hitting on some of the major issues that you guys are, are, are having to go through. Uh, we will be teaching um, an, an English adult worldview slash politics class starting in January, uh, where we'll go deeper into some of the current issues in society. 
Um, and and so that's that I think we're Sunday school Sundays are hard so we're looking to do that on Tuesday night starting in January. Um, and so if you're uh, if you're interested in asking more questions about some of these issues, you can ask Gabe, you can ask me, uh, and, and we'd be more than happy to kind of guide you and talk to you. Um, I'm going to put the discussion questions up. Uh, I'm going to also paste them. Let me stop. Oh, I'll, I'm going to let you see it right now. I'm going to pray for us, and afterwards I'll stop sharing, and then I will drop these discussion questions into the chat so that you'll have them um, as you have your, your discussion groups. Okay, so let me pray for us. Father, uh, we're just so thankful for this opportunity uh, to gather as, as young adults and to see theologically, uh, biblically, what it, what it means to have a Christ-centered biblical worldview when it comes to family, uh, not just reproducing children uh, and not just raising children to be Christians, though that is critical and, and, and of, of highest importance, but to help children develop and discover and to cultivate uh, that order that you've given, Lord, that, that to, to be, uh, to, to make an impact in this world for Jesus Christ. Help us to understand that. Help us to understand, Lord, uh, what it means to guard that traditional order. And as we live in this world where that is constantly challenged, Father, I pray that you would equip us to be wise. Uh, to be loving and to be missional in our speech, in our actions, in our thinking. Uh, Father, uh, we want to pray, Lord, for every young adult. I want to pray for those who are uh, are engaged. Uh, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would bless their engagement, watch over them, protect them uh, in areas of purity, in areas of, of, of emotions. Lord, I want to pray for those who are uh, dating, that you would also watch over them and guide them. Lord, I want to pray for those who are single, that you would continue to encourage and build them up and let them know how valuable singleness is, says the Apostle Paul, for the glory of God. Allow them to treasure this season, but Lord, also provide for them. I pray specifically for the young adults who are single who want to get married. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, through the power of the Spirit, that you would provide for them the one that you have ordained for them to marry. Lord, I pray, Lord, that whether it's through in transit or, or through another type of uh, fellowship or through another means or through friends introducing that you would provide that for them. And I pray that very specifically, knowing, Lord, that you are a good God. And, and I ask that as their pastor, loving them and saying, God, we ask this in humility. Uh, we don't demand this of you, but we're asking, Lord, that you would provide uh, a life mate for each and every in-transit member who desires it. And lastly, Lord, I want to pray for the, the married couples and parents in this room. Lord, help us. We need your help. We need the Spirit's guidance and power. Uh, continue to help us to come before you in humility. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, in-transit. Thank you.